let's take a look at radioactivity. So radioactivity refers to a process where an unstable nucleus changes, or decays, into a more stable nucleus by emitting radiation. And we have to be a little bit careful about that word radiation in physics because it can refer to different things depending on different contexts. When we talk about radioactivity here, radiation refers to one of three things, either alpha radiation, beta radiation, or gamma radiation. And alpha radiation is when the unstable nucleus emits a bundle containing two protons and two neutrons. In other words, it emits a helium nucleus. Now, why the heck would that be? Why is it emitting a helium nucleus? What's so special about helium? Don't worry about that right now. We're not going to get into it. Just know that if you start out with an unstable nucleus, and we're going to call it, at the beginning, we're going to call it a parent nucleus, if it decays by alpha radiation, then that means after the decay, you're left with a more stable nucleus, called a daughter nucleus, and an alpha particle. And the alpha particle contains two protons and two neutrons, and it's often, it often moves quite fast after it is emitted. Now if we have beta radiation, that's when you have an unstable nucleus that emits either an electron and an antineutrino, that's called beta minus decay, or a positron and a neutrino, that's called beta plus decay. Now I've just introduced some new things that you might not have heard of, like antineutrino, positron, neutrino. We will see these more in the future. For now, it's not important to know exactly what they mean. Just know that they are there. They are part of beta radiation. So if you have a parent nucleus that it decays by beta minus decay, then when it turns into that daughter nucleus, when it decays into the daughter nucleus, it emits an electron and an antineutrino and they go off in separate directions. The antineutrino is represented with the Greek letter nu, which looks like a V with a little, little tail hanging off of it, with a bar over it. The bar is over it because it's an antineutrino. Beta plus decay is when you have an unstable parent nucleus that decays into a more stable daughter nucleus by emitting a positron and a neutrino. The positron is, is represented with an E plus, Turns out that the positron is actually the antiparticle of an electron. We'll talk more about that later. And the neutrino is represented with just with the Greek letter nu. It does not have the bar over it because it's not an antiparticle. Gamma radiation is when the unstable nucleus emits a high energy gamma ray photon. So we have a parent nucleus that's unstable, and it decays into a more stable daughter nucleus by emitting a gamma ray photon. Now, in every case, mass and charge must be conserved. Now, there's a little bit of a bending in there that we're not going to worry about right now, and we'll see it in the future, but for now, we're going to consider mass and charge to be conserved. So, because of this conservation, or these conservation laws, we can write down radioactive decay equations and they're not exactly equations, they're actually reactions, because there's no equal sign, there's an arrow, but whatever. Let's look at an example. Let's say we have uranium-238, and that decays into thorium-234 by emitting an alpha particle. So we start out with uranium-238, and after the decay, we get thorium-234 plus the alpha particle. Now, the number up top in chemistry, that's often referred to as the mass number. It's the number of protons and neutrons contained in the nucleus. In physics, we also call it the nucleon number. Nucleon is a new term. Nucleon means either a proton or a neutron. Protons and neutrons are nucleons. In other words, a nucleon is any particle which is contained in the nucleus, which are protons and neutrons as far as we're concerned. So, uranium has 238 nucleons. It has 238 total protons and neutrons. Thorium has a nucleon number of 234. It has a total of 234 protons and neutrons. And the alpha particle has a nucleon number of 4. Total of 
four protons and neutrons together. The lower number, so this 92 in the lower left by the uranium, and then the 90 in the lower left by the thorium, and the 2 in the lower left by the alpha, that's the charge number. That's telling you the number of charges, or how many multiples of the fundamental charge E, there exists on that object. So uranium. Uranium has 92 positive charges in it because it has 92 protons in it. Thorium has 90 positive charges, and the alpha particle has two positive charges. It has two protons in it. So if mass is conserved, what that means is that the total number of nucleons on the left and on the right, so before the reaction and after the reaction, total number of nucleons has to be the same. So let's make sure that that works. Total number of nucleons has to be the same before and after. Well, before we had 238 nucleons. After, we had 234 plus 4, which is 238. So yeah, the nucleon number is conserved. Down below, let's look at the charges. Well, we have 92 positive charges over on the left. And then after the reaction, we have 90 in the thorium and then two positive charges on the alpha particle, which is 92 positive charges after the reaction. So yeah, the charge number is conserved. And for the different types of radiation, we have different uh, nucleon numbers and charge numbers. For the alpha particle, the alpha particle has a nucleon number of 4 and a charge number of 2. For beta minus, the electron and the antineutrino, well, neither of them are nucleons. So they have nucleon numbers of 0. The electron has a negative charge, so it has a charge number of negative 1. And it turns out the antineutrino has no charge, so the antineutrino has a charge number of zero. For beta plus, the positron has a zero nucleon number and a plus one charge number, and the neutrino has zero for both nucleon number and charge number. Gamma ray, well, that's a photon which has neither charge nor nucleon number, so a zero, zero. So if we look at another example, let's say we have sodium-21 and it decays by beta plus decay. So let's see, sodium-21, well sodium, if you look at a periodic table, it has uh, 11 protons in it, so it has a charge number of 11. And it decays into neon, and neon, let's say it's neon-21, and neon, if you look at a periodic table, it has 10 protons in it. And if it's beta decay, then over here on the left, we'll also have a positron and a neutrino. And we know the numbers that go on with those. Positron, 0, 1. Neutrino, 0, 0. So let's make sure that the nucleon number is the same on both sides of this reaction. Well, on the left side, we have 21. On the right side, we have 21 plus 0 plus 0. All right, that balances. Then let's look at the charge number. Well, down below, we have 11 for the sodium. For the neon, we have 10. For the positron, we have 1. For the neutrino, we have 0. So 11 on the left side, and then 10 plus 1 plus 0 on the right side. So yes, the charge number also balances. Now let's shift gears and look at half-life. So radioactive decay of an atom, or a nucleus, is random. But it is statistically predictable for large populations of atoms. So what I mean by that is we can't predict what a single nucleus will do at any given moment. But if we have many, many of the same type of unstable nucleus, we can predict the behavior of that big group very well. So if we have many, many nuclei of the same kind, what we say is that the average or mean time that it takes for 50%, for half of those nuclei to decay, is called the half-life. And the half-life symbol is T with a little one-half subscript. Every nuclide, and nuclide is a new term, nuclide just refers to a type of nucleus, every nuclide has a different half-life. So let's look at three different nuclides, three different types of nuclei. We're going to look at hydrogen-3, iodine-123, and lithium-12. Turns out, the half-life for hydrogen-3 is 4,500 days. The half-life for iodine-123 is 13 hours. And the half-life for lithium-12 is 10 to the minus 8 
seconds. So very different amounts of time in each case. But the half-life, remember, tells you how long you have to wait. It's the average amount of time that it takes for half of those nuclei of that type to decay. And we can make a graph of this to kind of demonstrate what we're talking about. Um, and we'll make a graph of, let's see, let's put time on the horizontal axis and then the number of radioactive nuclei on the vertical axis, um, or parent nuclei on the vertical axis. So if we start out with some number of nuclei, let's just call it N0. That's the starting number of nuclei. If we wait for one half, or excuse me, if we wait for one half-life, half of those nuclei will decay. Okay, so let's see, let's put that on the graph. And if we wait one more half-life, so if two half-lives have passed since the beginning, well, each half-life, half of the remaining nuclei decay. So after two half-lives have passed, we're left with one half of one half, or one fourth of the original number of nuclei. And then if we wait one additional half-life, well, then yet another half of the nuclei will decay. And so we'll be left with one eighth of the original number. And if we wait one more half-life, then a further half will be left, or will decay. And so we'll be left with one sixteenth of the original number of nuclei. So as each half-life passes by, as one more half-life passes by, half of the remaining nuclei decay. Now, radioactive nuclei, they appear naturally. They're not just created by human activity. They exist out in nature. And the number of radioactive particles that are detected without some natural, unnatural or artificial source around is called the background count. So the background count is just the amount of radioactive particles that we would detect without any strange radioactive emissions uh, other than the ones that are natural. So it varies from place to place. So the background count uh, when you're deep underground might be different than the background count if you are, say, on an airplane flying uh, at 30,000 feet. But it's always there. There is always a natural background radiation that's there. And we call this the background count. Also, each type of radiation has a different range or a different distance that it can travel and a different ionizing potential, which is kind of a measure of how much it can harm matter. So alpha particles, for instance. Alpha particles have a short range. Um, they're easily stopped by paper and your outer skin layer. Uh, but they are highly ionizing um, if they do reach the matter. Um, beta radiation has a moderate range. It can be stopped by tinfoil or by a quarter meter of air. Um, and it's moderately ionizing. So it's not as ionizing, not as damaging as alpha radiation. Um, but it is moderately ionizing, moderately damaging. Gamma rays have a very long range. Um, they're rarely stopped completely by anything. You can attenuate, you can reduce the number of gamma particles. Um, by, say, providing a huge amount of lead. Uh, but they have a very large ra long range. It's difficult to completely stop gamma rays. Um, but they do have a low ionization uh, potential. They're unlikely to interact with matter. However, one of the dangerous things about gamma radiation is that when it does interact with matter, even though that's unlikely, when it does interact with matter, it can cause lots of, lots of harm. Uh, remember, gamma radiation is a little photon with a huge amount of energy, at least huge amount uh, in nuclear terms. Uh, and so that large amount of energy contained in a gamma ray can cause lots of harm.